uh, Simone. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, next slide, please. And uh, can I just check you can hear me loud and clear? I can hear for sure. Perfect. Um, so just to give everyone an idea of what we're listening to today, we'll be starting off by introducing the creative of rewilding raves before asking why you should host a rewilding rave. Um, we'll look into how you can get involved and go through a few final tips before we have our Q and A. Next slide, please. So first of all, the creative, the visuals, and I feel like the best way to introduce the creative is to simply ask, what have you spotted? So next slide, please. So feel free to put it in the chat. Have you spotted any of our billboards that have been up and around the borough? Um, they ran for two weeks just after mid-August. Next slide. Um, and how about our social media ads asking you to host a house party? Next slide. So we had four different designs for these Instagram ads. They ran for two weeks following on from the billboards. Um, but following the very sad news of Her Majesty's departure, we decided not to further promote this campaign on social media. Um, yes, so next slide, please. And finally, have you spotted any of the 100 picket signs that we have got spread out across the borough? Um, so these are about to try to catch your eye and make you think twice about our wild spaces. The two we've got photographed here are both yellow, but you might have noticed there are a few other colours. They're rarer, so if you spot all four colours, I'll be very impressed. Um, but there's one thing that these creatives all have in common, and it's the website they send you to. So next slide. So this is our bespoke Rewilding Raves website. So that's what all the creatives send you to, either through the barcode or the link, or if you press learn more on the Instagram ads. Next slide, please. And the main message that we've got on this website and through the communications is to host a Rewilding Rave to invite nature to have a good time. So in other words, we're asking you to make your private and community spaces greener and wilder. Next slide, please. So why are we asking you to do this? Well, it should probably come as no surprise to hear that we are facing an ecological emergency. It affects the world, it affects us here in Hammersmith and Fulham. So what we're seeing in this ecological emergency is a loss of wildlife, loss of habitats and as a result a loss of ecosystem services which are tasks that benefit us which nature completes on its own so that's for example the pollination of crops to provide food flood control disease control the list goes on um, and we know this really is an emergency when we look at the extinction rate of species so currently one in four mammals are at risk of extinction as are one in six birds um, so experts estimate that the current extinction rate is 1,000 to 10,000 times higher than the natural background rate, which is quite scary. Um, next slide. And I'm not going to go into this too much. Feel free to put any questions in the chat if you would like more information. But just to scratch the surface, there are five key drivers of this ecological emergency. Habitat loss from urbanization and agriculture, unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, non-native invasive species being introduced to ecosystems who outcompete and spread disease, um, pollution ranging from gases to liquids to plastic pollution, and then of course, climate change. Next slide please. Right, so the last two slides were a little bit doom and gloomy. Um, and I'm not here to make you feel bad or anxious or anything like that. I'm just here to give you the facts. But just in case I did make you feel any negative emotions, I might as well say that it's not entirely bad news. People are becoming a lot more aware and a lot more connected to nature in recent years. And as a result, positive changes really are being made. So one example of this is the River Thames. It was declared completely biologically dead in 1970, 1957. Um, but it now hosts 125 different species. One example, my favourite example, is the short-snouted seahorse, which you can see on the right. 
Um, you won't find this in Hammersmith and Fulham. It's a little bit further west in salty waters. Um, and we can also see the evidence of positive change in our council services and community groups, and they are having an impact. And this example is a magnificent little butterfly called the brown hair streak. And it's been sighted in Hammersmith and Fulham for the first time since recordings began, which is really a good news story. Next slide, please. Um, but I would be bubble wrapping you if I said it's all good and fine. Um, and my example of how we know it's not all good and fine is this lovely little bird. So can I ask, when was the last time you saw a sparrow? Um, put it in the chat. Was it today? Was it in the last week? It was it in the last month. Um, they are supposed to be our most common bird, according to the RSPB. So hopefully you've seen one recently. But let me open the chat and see what people are saying. No one's talking about sparrows yet. That's OK. Can I get yeah, no idea? There we go. In the last week, that's not too bad. Great. Mark, if you could just tap one more time. Perfect. So in London, sparrow numbers have fell by 60% between 1994 and 2004, and they're continuing to drop. Um, the house sparrow is now on the red list of conservation. It's a priority bat species. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, the population is declining. Next slide, please. So just to recap, nature is absolutely under threat. We've seen both habitat and species lost in Hammersmith and Fulham, but we are working across all our services to tackle the ecological emergency. And we can see that difference. There are species that are making a comeback, but others such as this little cute hedgehog will need a bit more intervention to have their chance. Next slide, please. But that doesn't really answer our question. So why rewilding raves? Well, let me introduce you to a more local challenge or possibly opportunity, depending on how optimistic you feel. Next slide, please. Hammersmith and Fulham Gardens. So this is the challenge slash opportunity. So if you take a look at the figure on the left, ignore the gray. Those are parks and open spaces or very industrial areas such as Westfield um, or Hammersmith Broadway. Um, it's what's in color that you want to look at. And these are private gardens. So where it's green, you can see that they're very well vegetated. People have lawns, trees, so on. But where it is yellow, these are mostly paved over gardens. Um, and private gardens make up approximately 17% of the land area in our borough, while parks make up approximately 16%. And out of all of the gardens we have in Hammersmith Fulham, 31% of them are either completely paved over or without vegetation, which is quite a scary figure. Um, so next slide, please. And it really, really matters because gardens are so important. So gardens are ideal wildlife corridors linking up our larger natural spaces. This means they're vital for populations to spread. So for example, you know, really good garden corridors could see the spread of the brown hair streak. Um, and it also supports species that have to travel long distances um, in search for food. So bats and hedgehogs, um, hedgehogs we don't have, but that's why we don't have them because it's so divided, they can't get over fences, so on. Um, gardens are valuable habitats on their own. They're an oasis amongst brick and concrete. And they're definitely valuable for more than just nature. I mean, after all, would you prefer to have a garden on the left or the garden on the right? I know the garden on the left would be a little bit less maintenance. But at the end of the day, gardens support our mental health. We can use them to grow food, they reduce flood risk, and they provide cool spots during heat waves. Next slide, please. So now that we know why we want rewilding raves, how can you take part? So let's start at home. Um, the very first thing that I really want to stress is you don't need a private garden to invite nature to your house party. Um, and I think this photo that I took in the north of the borough, with the permission of the owner um, of this canal boat, is a really great example. 
you can use anything to introduce nature, a windowsill, a doorstep, a balcony, even the roof of a canal boat. Um, any space at all can make a difference. So go ahead and get planting or begin to plant for spring. We'd like to recommend native plants and those with the RHS plants for pollinator sticker. You'll find them in any shop, whether it's Sainsbury's, Wilco, garden centers. This RHS sticker is absolutely everywhere. Um, and yeah, it's very important to note that we've partnered with W6 Garden Center to offer you 15% off all outdoor garden plants. You just have to quote Pam Smith rewilding offer at the till. And I spelled rewilding wrong there, didn't I? Never mind. Next slide. Before our second tip, we really want to ask you to be less tidy. Mow less or not at all. Support weeds. They're often the best plants for our lovely pollinators, um, which go on to support the birds and the bats. Leave dead wood. Let fallen leaves sit a while longer. Um, and I have noted, do still keep an eye out for invasive species. They are very rare, but where you need to remove them and report them as necessary. Next slide, please. And for our third tip, we're asking you to go wet and wild. Um, adding water features is one of the very best things you can do to support wildlife. You don't need a massive garden to do this. I know that's a common misconception. You can make a bucket pond, such as the one in the photo to the right. Um, so fun fact about me is that I work in a local primary school on Fridays. And together with the students, this is a little bucket pond that we made. Um, I literally bought a washing up basin from Wilco for a tenner. We dug a hole, we put the basin in, we filled it with water. I got the kids to throw in some rocks and twigs and, and so on. Um, and in just two weeks, we had our first little froggy visitor. Can you spot it in the picture? Um, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is this really can be done by anyone, anywhere. Um, just make sure you consider safety. So for example, with this one, it wasn't a raised bed. We did the risk assessment and everything. Um, and yeah, do, do add wet features. Next slide, please. And our final, perhaps most specific tip for a house party is to add dead wood to your garden and make a beetle hotel. Um, this is a really valuable habitat and there's a few different options which you can see on the side. You could make a log pyramid just by burying logs at different depths. You could have a retained stump, just requires you to leave the stump and a root of um, a dead tree. Or you can make a lovely log pile where you just stack up some logs. Um, in terms of garden design, I really recommend this quite interesting feature for a shaded corner where you can't get much to grow. Add a few ferns and it would look absolutely lovely. Um, and it's absolutely great for wildlife. Next slide, please. So how else could you have a rewilding rave, perhaps in your streets? Next slide. Um, and I think this first tip is a really lovely option, especially if you don't have the space to do much gardening yourself. Um, say your landlord doesn't let you have window boxes or so on, so on, so on. Um, so in Hammersmith Fulham, we really encourage you to do gardening in suitable tree bases. We have a full guide for this. I'll try to share the link in the chat after the presentation. But the key points are that, you know, you use native plants, pollinator friendly plants, avoid digging too deep so that you don't harm the tree's roots. Um, and definitely notify us where and when you'll be planting in tree bases. If you don't, our contractors might not be aware and they might pull up your plants, they might think they're weeds. Um, so do let us know so that we can make sure that it's all yours. Um, but funding is potentially available if you, you as a community would like to host a wild street party and um, plant lots of street tree bases. Um, I'll share a link so that you get more information at the end. Next slide, please. So tip number two is to nudge your neighbor to depave. And I've used this picture, not because I think it's a good ecological design, but because I think it's a great way of showing you that you don't need to depave your entire garden. Borders, plant pots, they all make a difference. Um, converting to permeable paving will also help with surface water issues and wall climbing plants could help cool your home or provide extra insulation in winter. Um, so do it yourself, set an example, have a conversation and nudge your neighbours. Um, I will add that there is a pilot project to help people depay their front common gardens upcoming, but that's all I can share at the moment. So do keep your eyes on our comms 
um, if you want to know more in the future. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, tip number three for street parties is create a wildlife corridor. So work with your neighbor and or street to make these wildlife corridors. You can make hedgehog highways. We don't have hedgehogs in the borough, but they will help our amphibians and reptiles. And hopefully we will get hedgehogs once again. So they'll help hedgehogs once they hopefully return. Um, and join up your hedgerows, tree lines, that will really help birds and bats. Sharing seeds, tips and tricks will also help your whole street become more wildlife friendly. Next slide. Um, so that's all we've got for our wild house party and street party. I have just got a few final tips to help you get you started. Um, while I am a qualified ecologist, I am still very much an amateur gardener. And I think you can always learn new things. So if there are any gardeners on the call, please do share your own tips and tricks and what you think the best thing to do at this time of year is in the chat. Um, but otherwise, I will have a few tips to share. Next slide. So for this time of year, I think a few of the best actions you can take is to plant spring bulbs. That's for daffodils, bluebells, crocus, and so on. They come back year after year, so they're really good for beginners. Um, and they provide vital food at the start of the year when not much else is flowering. It's still suitable to plant some perennials at this time of year, just check. Um, most garden centers will only be selling ones that are suitable to plant, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, letting fallen leaves sit a little while longer, or piling them up in one designated corner is a great thing you can do for invertebrates. And there is, it is still a suitable time to depave, add water features, beetle hotels, um, that's all great. And planting trees would be perfect for a little bit later in the year. The other thing you can do, of course, is plan ahead for spring when things really start getting moving. Next slide, please. And the other tip I really want to share is if you don't have time to do gardening, the very best thing you can do is just let your garden grow wild. You know, reduced mowing will create a a meadow habitat, you'll soon spot daisies, clovers, possibly like bird foot trefoil among the grass, and that's an absolutely perfect habitat for wildlife. Um, and if you're worried about what your neighbour will think, because I know there is this misconception of wild gardens being messy, um, look up the Blue Hearts campaign, Blue Hearts Gardens, and you can find out what other people are doing to tackle the misconception and let people know it is deliberate, you're not being lazy, you know, this is for wildlife. Um, next slide, please. And I've just got two final slides with a few reminders and tips. Choose native plants, top one. Um, pollinator friendly plants and shrubs slash trees which provide shelter and nesting is very important. I personally opt for perennials over annuals. So perennials are plants that will come back year after year or remain green throughout the year. Whereas annuals will really just survive for one year and then die. But you know, it might be your style to have annuals and switch them up every year so it's completely up to you um, plant your trees in winter and plants with tougher leaves are typically more climate resilient so think basil versus sage basil the leaves break very easily they're very delicate and thin whereas sage the leaves are a bit thicker a little bit harder to break um, this is typical not always the case but i think good advice nonetheless next slide and then please add a water feature. Um, consider the environmental suitability of the area you're planting. So again, shady areas, think ferns, shade tolerant plants, log piles, um, and, and do give wildlife a helping hand over winter. You know, feel free to, to feed birds. Just don't forget to feed the, clean the feeders regularly to stop bird flu and so on. Um, and if in doubt, just ask the super friendly garden experts at W6. And don't forget, you can get 15% off of any outdoor plant until the end of October if you quote Hammersmith rewilding offer at the top. Next slide, please. Um, and just before I move on to the Q and A, um, I want to add that this campaign isn't a one-off. You can expect more incentives to host a rewilding rave next spring. Next slide. So now we've got the Q and A, I'll hand over to Mark, but I will quickly add that our lead ecologist is also on the call um, and might be able to answer any questions, but I can't. That's uh, fantastic. 